John Milligan's a nice fellow. John Milligan, nice Milligan fellow. fellow. And uh, he's such an artist. Yeah. Oh, he is. Yeah. And he's also got the good head on his shoulders, and this is really a good day. But I'm really looking forward to talking to Robert Ashford, my old friend, and welcome very much to our conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program a, a, a dear personal, uh, professional friend of mine from way back, and that being Robert Ashford. Those who view the program will know we've talked with Robert on a number of occasions. He's the co-author. He I might just say he's the uh, a professor of law at the Syracuse University College of Law, and he's the co-author of a book. We'll let people look the way you maybe would look in the bookstores or so forth. It's called Binary Economics, The New Paradigm a system of thought that contains a, a new basis of economic theorizing that is, in my estimation, and a growing number of people, destined to be the one which is going to serve us uh, henceforth as we begin to move into the new, the, the new 21st century. And uh, Bob, welcome really very much. It's so good to see you once again. Welcome to Conversation Manhattan Network. Thank you, Harold. It's always a pleasure to be here with it you. It is indeed. It is indeed. Now, we've talked with you a number of times and so forth, but maybe you could share just briefly your own background, because I know you're a, law, you're a professor of law. Share a little of your own background, and we want to get into the sub and substance and give you a chance to get into the sub and substance of this um, binary economic, uh, the new paradigm, uh, which I agree with you, it really is that, and what that means and so forth. But could you share your own background, please? Well, the earliest part of my background is I'm just, I was part of a family that was very committed to making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. My father and my mother were committed to leaving the world better than they found it, and they had a very a strong a commitment to helping uh, the, the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And that was just a part of our family ethic and a part of um, a par part of the orientation, I guess that's where your heart is. The advantaged and, uh, usually don't need that much help because they're doing okay by themselves. The, well, the disadvantaged. The disadvantaged yes, that you the want to help, and yes, they're the ones who, if you got something, yes, if I see yeah, that's like socially conscious way. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I majored in uh, um, physics and English in college, and then went on to law school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I felt that neither the sciences uh, nor the uh, literature would would sort of put me in the the cutting edge of leaving the world. Mm -hmm. It's not that people in those fields don't do great things, but this is where I, the, uh, in the area of, of, of law uh, was where I thought I could make my contribution. You went to Harvard, right? I went to Harvard Law uh -huh. School, graduated uh -huh. with honors, I'm mm -hmm. glad to say. And, yes. And I teach law at Syracuse University. Uh -huh. uh, but through my life, I um, uh, met uh, someone named Lewis Kelso, who was the author of an idea that became known as binary economics. Mm -hmm. And of all the ideas that were offered to help uh, the economically disadvantaged people, mm -hmm. this idea seemed to me to capture the greatest potential mm -hmm. for having a systemic change. And that led to uh, studying his ideas and then writing some articles and then teaming up with uh, Rodney Shakespeare, as you say, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to write this book on binary economics. Right. It's called Binary Economics, The New Paradigm. Right. And, and maybe the audience would like to know, you know, what do you mean by it uh, might, but I wonder if we could take a minute. When sure. did you first did, did you did you did you come across uh, Lewis Kelso's writings first, and then that tweaked your, you know, your curiosity and imagination and so forth, or did you meet the man first, or how did you <coughs> happen to come in contact? Because well, I know you worked I closely with him <coughs> uh, when he was doing his work in San Francisco largely. I was uh, uh, an associate with a large firm in San Francisco, which has become a large global firm mm -hmm. called Morrison and Forrester. Okay. It's a fine firm. Law firm? L law firm. And right. they, have, they had then and they have now an excellent uh, uh, pro bono outreach. They're a very, very enlightened firm in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in the tax department in real estate and helping them do their work in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I realized that in a very real sense, at least it seemed to me, that, that the work I was doing was helping the rich get richer mm -hmm. and was doing very little uh, for the poor. Mm -hmm. It was providing capital acquisition mm -hmm. for the already wealthy, mm -hmm. and the best you could say would be j the tax base for jobs and welfare uh -huh. for, for the poor, the ta jobs for the poor, right. and then whatever you couldn't take. And that system um, made me dissatisfied. And I remember telling the senior partner that I was working with, uh, his name was Robert Raven, he's mm -hmm. passed away now, but a wonderful man, mm -hmm. former president of the ABA, uh, active in the bar uh, for public work. I said. That's what I said to you, that my concern is that I'm helping the rich get richer, but mm -hmm. I'm not doing enough for the poor. And he says, well, if you 
are concerned about that and you want to help the poor get richer, you ought to meet Lewis Kelso, one uh -huh. of my clients. Oh, he introduced you. So he introduced oh, me to Lewis to Kelso, man, right? and then I read his works. Uh, uh -huh. The one that, that I cut my teeth on was a book called Two Factor Theory. He and you can that. see where two factor theory has now evolved into uh, the terminology binary economics. About six months before Lewis Kelso passed away, uh -huh. he called me and he said, you know, I finally settled on a term that I think is better than the other terms. He used to call it the theory of capitalism, right? because he said that traditional capitalism has no theory. Mm -hmm. He used to call it the theory of universal capitalism, uh -huh. because it wants to make everybody a capitalist mm -hmm. and sees the potential in that. Mm -hmm. Then he called it two-factor theory. Mm -hmm. One other, some other names, and then, but finally, since I settled on binary economics, and uh -huh. so that's, that's the way, we, uh, this is a, um, yeah. It's a tribute to him, yeah. and, and I've come to understand more and more that the binary is really a very important part of it. Yeah. And uh, to, un I, to help the audience understand, um, the binary stands for the fact that there are two ways of earning a living. Mm -hmm. One is through your labor, mm -hmm. and then one is through your capital ownership. And, th and that sounds like a simple, obvious thing, but when you understand the binary approach, it hooks up in a way that helps us understand all the events around us in a, in a, in a, in a new light. Well, that's interesting. interesting. Binary is also the binary code in that sort of but, thing. We're uh, but the different binary. in that sense. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the binary in terms of yes, no. no uh, it's the binary in terms of you know, capital and labor. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Now, go ahead. And no, I was just going to say, is it necessary? Is that an important distinction in terms of people who theorize about economics? Uh, would they say that's self-evident or is it so well, factual no significance? But, they, they would, but that uh, most of the people who view and most of the people who live and work in the world economy and so forth, gain an income from having some sort of a job or a labor relationship to production. And the capital assets, which are part of the productive process, are in all economies, it seems to me, and in the they're world, highly are concentrated. They're very highly concentrated in a small class yeah. of capital owners that only represent yeah. maybe 5% of the population. And that's a problem. Now, you know, we, the people think of capitalism as being broader, and the New York Stock Exchange, for example, advertises that they have 52 million stockholders. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit like the river that's 10 miles wide, but mostly an inch deep. Uh -huh. Because the average, the median stockholder investor uh, in our society ha is a 46-year-old white male and, and has about a $13,000 if that high right now because we're in a slump, yeah. $13,000, very, very, it's a trifling of capital. Yes. But I think it's important for your audience to understand uh, why we call it the new paradigm. All right, please. Uh, yeah. and, and it's important to understand that uh, when we say a new paradigm, here we get our lesson from the sciences in a way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've had uh, since uh, um, the last three or 400 years, three or four scientific revolutions, if not more, that is to say, fundamental ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And paradigms are important Thomas beca Cohen? because he wrote a book called The Structure of, of, of Scientific, Scientific Revolution. Yeah. And he realized what he mm -hmm. taught was that we really learn in two different ways mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, the process. One is we learn incrementally. Mm -hmm. We start with a foundation of way of looking at things. We sort of fill in the branches and we, and we start with that foundation. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we learn by having a whole new foundation that's yeah. That it's, 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 it's not a connection with the past. And to look at it this way, the important thing about a new paradigm, uh -huh. there's only re the only reason to learn a new paradigm is if it does one of two things, or both. Mm -hmm. One is to dispel an illusion, mm -hmm. that is, an illusion that is leading us astray. Mm -hmm. And the other one uh, is to address an anomaly, something that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. under the old paradigm. And I always use the best example for that uh, to give people an understanding of how we're talking about getting out of ourselves, mm -hmm. to think, think of us, think beyond what we think, out of the box, I call it. Is every morning, if the sun, if the uh, if the sky is clear in the east, you see the sunrise, mm -hmm. and every evening, if the, if the horizon is clear in the west, you see the sunset. Billions of people see it, mm -hmm. and you could measure it, but it's a complete illusion. Mm -hmm. The sun does not rise, yeah. and the sun does not set, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and it's an illusion built on a false premise. But once you have the earth going around the sun, a different premise, then everything is explained, and everything you see is explained, and so right. it, it dispels yeah. an illusion. Yeah, now, right. like and a geocentric view it, of the universe uh, yes. as opposed to a heliocentric. It's, it, 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 now, there it are those that say... It pretty now, rough when now that happened. That really messed people's well, it, identity people, up. It, 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 all, it destroyed their sense that they were the center of things. Yeah. But it's important to realize that some people mm -hmm. argue relativists argue mm -hmm. 
that well earth going around the sun the sun going around the earth it's all the same you know we could do you know professors are known for their narcissism we could do it all around my navel if you know it be very convenient for me but the truth is that it's not relative that is to say it's only when you get the earth going around the sun with the sun at the focus of, a, of an ellipse mm -hmm. it's only then uh, that Newton's laws make sense right. right so you have a whole new statement mm -hmm. you know people say what's new in philosophy and I say, well Newton had a new idea he said force equals mass times acceleration mm -hmm. the world's never been the same mm -hmm. it lays the foundation yeah. for science mm -hmm. now since Newton mm -hmm. with the physical world that has not changed mm -hmm. we've had probably 10 scientific revolutions of different ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. The physical world, since Adam Smith, mm -hmm. in terms of how we make things, mm -hmm. the technology involved, mm -hmm. it's vastly changed, but we're still with the same old mm -hmm. illusion. Now, what's the illusion that binary economics explains? The, it's the illusion that capital makes labor more productive. Right, yeah, productivity. Pro productivity. It's labor productivity. Adam Smith considered yeah. that cap the role of capital is to make labor more productive. So if you saw 10 boards an hour by hand and 100 boards an hour in, with a machine saw, mm -hmm. the person is 10 times as productive. Capital makes labor more productive. By the way, Smith never saw a machine saw. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, he was yeah, operating was long before. Coming that. out of a feudal area. And yeah. when he looked back, he, his wealth of nations, when he looked backward, he looked at back to the time of Henry VIII and he says, it seems to me that our economy has been growing. Mm -hmm. that is, it seems to me. Yeah. He was talking about the accumulating wealth of nations. Uh -huh. Well, nobody would look back today, 100 years, and say, it seems yeah, right, right, right. like our economy is growing. There's uh -huh. something vastly happening. Uh -huh. so, so, uh -huh. no, so the binary view uh -huh. of why we have this growth uh -huh. is not that capital makes labor more productive, uh -huh. but capital is doing more of the work. So it's more like this. You haul a sack a mile, whew, you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. You put 10 sacks on a donkey or a horse, they go twice as far in half the time. Mm -hmm. And the horse is doing all of the extra work. The horse is doing something far more important than increase the human productivity. Mm -hmm. The horse is doing, then you turn an ignition key on in the truck and you do 50,000 sack miles worth of work. The truck is doing most of the extra work. So the binary in binary economics is that labor is a productive factor, but capital is also a productive factor. And they're independently productive in the sense that they're independent variables. Well, let me just put one more point on the table right, on, on this. Yeah. And that is, we talk about Adam Smith. Talk, uh, John Maynard Keynes mm -hmm. is, the gr is another one of the great uh, economists. He distilled the economy in his general theory mm -hmm. to time, money, and labor, the three fundamental variables have to be much of, a, much of a mathematician to realize that if time, money, and labor are the fundamental variables, capital is a dependent variable. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not an independent variable. Mm -hmm. So the con binary economists, uh, what's binary about binary economics is that you need time, money, labor, and capital is an independent factor. Mm -hmm. Independent. Independent factor. Yeah. Now, if you only let me go on just a little bit more, and I'll let you, let you get ahead. a word in here. No, 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 that's all right. <laughs> is that once you recognize mm -hmm. that capital is independently productive, then you realize that it has six marvelous growth enhancing qualities that are independent of human productivity. Let's count them. Right. Capital replaces labor. Uh, it so, certainly so, can, yeah. So that creates leisure. Mm -hmm. But it's almost a misnomer to say capital replaces labor. That's the, the margin, the substitution of capital. Because anytime you replace labor with capital, you almost always get vastly more productive capacity. The horse hauls far more than the human does, right. and the truck far more than the... So and new so opportunities to engage human beings in the labor function that in that expanded... But system. always less labor per unit of output. Okay. So, so the second thing that capital does is it vastly supplements labor mm -hmm. with vastly more productive power of its own. Yeah, I was going to take that, that thing you said about the, the uh, truck, and you could extend that to a, a railroad with oh, sure. 100 cars hauling with one <coughs> guy driving it that might even be he goes able on. to be automated. In every field, it's yeah. the work of that, of that sort is there. Now, then the third thing capital does, and I love telling people this, um, is capital does work that labor can never, ever, ever do. Like what? Well, I love to tell people mm -hmm. that a farmer never grew an apple. A all a farmer can do is help a tree, which is capital, mm -hmm. grow an apple better. Mm -hmm. But a farmer cannot grow an apple. You know, we marvel at the, at the computer revolution and everything. 
We can't make. Well, we I cannot do. make computer games. Uh -huh. What do you mean we, we can't? We make? can't make it. You can't make a computer. You try. If you're from here to doomsday. Well, I would be hopeless. No. But no. But but, uh, but Capital uh, Instruments, if guided, uh -huh. can make computer games. But we cannot make computer games. That's they not can something we can. They can we need the tools. Oh. To do the work, we could never do it. Yeah, because so it's so fine-tuned. Yeah, you can't deal yeah. you, with nanotechnology, all the little things. Nanotechnology is coming. And again, we can't do that. Uh -huh. We can only, only so capital Human. changes our whole relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with everything. Now, the fourth thing capital can do is work without labor. And there are t countless ways. Every automatic teller machine, every toll booth that's been done, automatic. Elevators, uh, you automatic, just push the uh, button, you don't need the guy yeah. to run the machine. People yeah. say, if you don't think capital does work without you, try living without your washing machine. Yeah. Uh, that is, capital works without labor. The oil derrick in the ground. Now, it is true that it takes a person maybe to set the machine up and maintain the machine. Yeah. But, the, labor, maintenance, no. but the maintenance work mm -hmm. is not the work of the machine maintained. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if I were your doctor mm -hmm. and saved your life uh, with an operation and then checked you up every month and kept you healthy, mm -hmm. I may be maintaining you in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But the work, your work is your own. It's not, the work of the maintenance person is not the work. The, the work of inventing, uh -huh. or the, work, the work of entrepreneur, all, that's, that's the labor work, but the capital work. So those are four things that capital does uh, that, that, is in, that is independent of the, the idea that capital makes labor more productive. Do you think this Two more. Okay. Two more coming. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Capital can buy itself on the promise of its future income. The first four powers of capital were the real powers. Now we move into the sophisticated world of finance, corporate finance, and, and uh, globalization, and, 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 and the private property system, and the laws and regimes that protect it. Mm -hmm. Capital can buy itself on the promise of its future income. And I want to say, to give a plug to the law, on the enforceable promise of its future income. Okay, okay, that's So you need the law. Yeah. Because you only invest law, in things yeah. that pay for themselves. And you can't do that if you can't honor contracts right. and things That's like right. that. Yeah, or right. all those libertarians who yeah. say, let's just let, you know. Yeah, the, let it go. Kick out the jam. The, the, yeah. I, I can say that you, nobody yeah. brings his or her goods to the market uh -huh. unless the law protects you yeah. on the way from highwaymen. Uh -huh. and, right. the, and the sixth thing that capital can do, and this is an expression of something called Say's Law, mm -hmm. is that in theory, in the perfect world, mm -hmm. although we don't get there, we can edge toward that. Capital has the capacity to distribute the income necessary to purchase its output. Supply creates its own demand. S if it's uh, broadly, if it's right, right. Su supply broadly acquired, yeah. uh -huh. now replace, uh, 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 creates its own demand. But I happen to have noticed so that the uh, capital ownership is not broadly acquired well, in this economy well, or any economy or national economy. That's because we have a, a defective system. Ownership, a small ownership class that throughout all of human history has sort of been the guys that ran what, things. Once you recognize that capital is doing most of the work, then uh -huh. there's another phenomenon. Almost all capital today is acquired with the earnings of capital. Retained earnings? Retur the, re the earnings of capital, not mm -hmm. with the earnings of labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we tell poor and working people, mm -hmm. the way to get capital is to work hard, save, save. invest wisely, yeah. maybe become an entrepreneur. Well, that's, that's fine for the few. Mm -hmm. And it's even fine for few who start very poor because the excellent people and the lucky people mm -hmm. and the enterprising people can break this capital barrier. But capital can buy itself even if you're not that excellent. That is to say, if I could summarize binary economics in one sentence, oh, that's it good. would be just like force equals mass times acceleration mm -hmm. when Newton spoke. Mm -hmm. The more broadly capital is acquired, yeah. the more economic growth we will have. And that to emphasize that point, it would be good to mention another topic we haven't looked at before in this discussion. One of the roles of a lawyer mm -hmm. is, is to help the client. And what sometimes the way you help the client is to look at what the other side doesn't talk about. Mm -hmm. And that is the issue of the concentration mm -hmm. of, of ownership. Yeah, people don't want to talk about the, that. The, the, the truth is that whether, you're, whether you believe in the economics of Adam Smith uh, whether you believe in the economics of the, what they call the neoclassical school, mm -hmm. or the Marshall, uh, uh, and Alfred Marshall, mm -hmm. or whether you believe in the econo economics of Keynes, mm -hmm. um, they all have one thing in common, uh, and that is that they all uh, say that the concentration of ownership is not important. And that leads to the other issue, and that is to say the issue of unutilized productive 
the passage. Could I jump in with Karl Marx there? You Surely. didn't mention Karl Marx, and he had this idea of the, the, the labor theory of value. I don't know if you're critiquing the labor theory of value, mm -hmm. and they had in the Marxian analysis the surplus labor mm -hmm. theory of value, that all value is created by labor, and capital is congealed labor or stolen, and they wanted to do away with the evil institution in their mind that led to the inequity, which was um, you know, private property itself. And so that was part of a Marxist, communist, or a socialist critique of the traditional capitalist system where all <coughs> the capital assets are owned, private property owned by a small class that gets ever richer, what plutocratic what in their own right, the robber barons, that sort of what thing. What Marx did not see mm -hmm. was that capital ownership could be widely broadened. Uh, that's he, was an almost, he was an almost well, binary well, economist. Well, he, Lewis he, he, did, he, did see, he did see the power of capital, but he denied it in the, in the labor theory of value. Mm -hmm. but, but, I, but Marx did see, and Keynes mm -hmm. did see, the fact that we have unutilized capacity. And that's, and okay. that, that is, okay. that's the anomaly. Yeah, we I talked yeah. about the illusion mm -hmm. that capital makes labor more productive. That's mm -hmm. the, the anomaly we have mm -hmm. is the anomaly of unutilized productive capacity. Now that's a kind of that, that's just something you have to focus on. I always like to say, Harold, if I could make you the czar of the world, mm -hmm. and you could feed, and, and your goal would be to feed and clothe and shelter the world, and give people the resources to be able to, to pr behave voluntarily and develop their talent. Yeah, I'd like that very much. Now, now, however difficult it would be do it would be to do that in 2005 today. It'd be yeah. easier than in 1905. Absolutely. Easier than in 1805. And easier than and because something is growing. This unutilized capacity is growing. Right. Uh, and uh, if I said, well, no, it is growing. It, it, has it been there? Was it there? Well, in Eden? it's controversial. Was it in the, is it inherent in the evolutionary I, process? I, I, or I not? only, I, I'm only willing to go back to the time of Adam Smith. We have more. We, I'm willing to say that it was more than. And he looked back to the time of Henry the uh -huh. and said, which seemed to be a little bit greater. Maybe so, more so, important. But it's huge. I say it's huge today. Maybe more important than wealth in nations. 1776. No. That was the year the steam engine was yeah, invented. Now it's important when you say now, and industrial some would revolution. Say, yeah. Some would say, "How do you? Th what do you mean by unutilized capacity?" And now yeah. I'm going to give you another. I would like you to explain another that, another, yeah. another issue here. Okay. Suppose you're still the czar of the world. I'm the czar of the yeah. world. The whole wide but, world. But now you don't have this mm -hmm. goal of feeding and clothing and sheltering. Well, you have a different goal. I would call it a perverse goal. I don't. It's not true of you, but just hypothetically. I like you're, that you're, goal you're, you had for me earlier, you're, if you don't you're, mind. Yeah, yeah. But, no, but well, just but hypothetically to test what we mean here. Suppose your goal were different. Suppose. Just the way the pharaohs loved pyramids, mm -hmm. you love unutilized productive capacity. Mm -hmm. it, it's not enough for you to have two or three plants in Flint, Michigan that are idle. You'd like to have 13 plants in Flint, Michigan that are idle. You just love it because it's, it's your just perverse nature. Mm -hmm. um, well, we could build more plants in Flint, Michigan today and have mm -hmm. them fallow than mm -hmm. we could have 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, we have the capacity not not only to produce more consumer goods that people dearly need and want, mm -hmm. we have the capacity capital to produce goods. more capital goods yeah. too. Yeah. Now, uh, the economist uh -huh. doesn't really I don't devote think their attention to on this. They, they have a very stingy view of the word parsimony. unutilized capacity. Very, very parsimonious view. Yeah. They, they talk about unutilized capacity where the numerator mm -hmm. is the existing plants, equipment, and employees that you're not using. But you could. Yeah, that's what people would and think. And the denominator uh -huh. is the existing plant and equipment. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't explain the unutilized capacity that would come if, if, if we could just empower the people to consume. Now look at it from the point well of view. Well, that's because there's inadequate demand, well, in that's simple terms, for yeah. among the folks to buy the things and that and we're totally capable of demand? producing. And why is there is that what Was that correct? That is correct. Unutilized productive capacity and you're thinking is the pe we have a capability, but the folks, the, the people of the world, do not have the means to clear the market That's right. That's right. Uh, because That's they right. don't have the income or the source of the income right. to buy that which we're totally capable of producing, ecologically That's good right. growth and so forth. Now, right. if you go that far yeah. or no further, mm -hmm. people will think you're a Keynesian because now it's important to recognize that of all the, of all the market economists, mm -hmm. Smith, Smith advises government, from, from his grave, mm -hmm. Marshall, Alfred Marshall, advises government. A lot of the, a lot of Ricardo, the Republican Party, Ricardo, advantage. Uh, he does that. Uh, um, uh, and uh, Keynes, of all the people, Marx. Don't and forget, and Marx, you just said Marx. No, I said the, I'm talking about the Marx? market economy. Oh, oh, market economy. Okay. okay now, yeah, now yeah. of all of them, the only one 
to recognize the existence of unutilized productive capacity in a central way is Keynes. Uh -huh. We have Keynesian economics mm -hmm. because in 1933, mm -hmm. unutilized productive capacity it was pretty was obvious a, was a politically undeniable fact. Absolutely, no and, doubt and, about and, it. And to make the point, think uh -huh. of tr the passenger trains mm -hmm. driving through the countryside. Mm -hmm bereft of passengers mm -hmm. able to pay the fare. Mm -hmm. The freight train, mm -hmm. empty of freight, because nobody well, would buy them. But full, full of, of people <laughs> yes, right. looking, now well, that was the yeah, essence. Right, right. But we have more unutilized productive capacity today, uh -huh. in the broader sense of uh -huh. the term, of being mm -hmm. able to create, than we had that. And that, now, now, one thing you could do as a scientist, and my undergraduate training comes out of physics, mm -hmm. as well as English literature, mm -hmm. is that when you've got four theories, mm -hmm. and we, what are they? I'm going to talk about um, Smith, I'm going to talk about Marshall, the neoclassical, mm -hmm. Keynes, and the monetarist. Mm -hmm. the, all right, these theories, all these, that's spelled three mm -hmm. three, all these theories, and you could throw Marx in there too. They all, they all have uh, one thing in common, they have not dealt with, the with what you deal with of unutilized capacity. So uh -huh. one way you could approach it scientifically, is what do they share in common? Mm -hmm. What's the one assumption that they share in common? A good lawyer will say, well, What's the assumption of the opposition yeah, right, that right. This fails to explain the thing? Yeah. And they all agree on one thing, and that is that the distribution of ownership has no strong positive relationship to the to employment uh -huh. of unutilized productive capacity right. and then the incentive for more growth. Yeah. So if you simply suspend uh -huh. that unproven assumption, uh -huh. you've got binary economics. Uh -huh. Because it's the opposite. It says the more broadly capital is utilized, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the more the more demand there will be to employ unutilized capacity, and the more promise there will be for growth. You so can build supply. It's like simul financing to build yes, supply and demand in the same process. Would that exactly be the right. thing? Mr. Nixon, 1972, I believe, 70, said we're all Keynesians now. And the thing I would ask you now, if we look at this globalizing world and so yes. forth, we've got Friedman, and then we have... Uh, we had Chum Peter, we had Hayek. He focused on that. Yeah, Chum Peter, Peter, creative entrepreneurialism, yes. that sort of thing. We had that. And we have uh, Friedman, mm -hmm. and then we have the Mundell, the supply side guys, and all that sort of thing. I would like to know if we're talking, what are we all now in terms of what is the theory that's motivating uh, the uh, globalization and the economic, <coughs> and a big macro view that's we're all now, well, that we were Keynesians in 1972. <coughs> what well, are we all now, and what's the theory behind? this process by which the globalization process well, taking place and so forth? I don't think we have a single coherent theory. I think we pick people pick and choose uh, as is convenient, and that's one of the problems. We don't have a single, but one thing we do have, mm -hmm. and that is we have a set of theories uh -huh. from all of, which agree. all of which agree that the distribution of ownership uh -huh. is not fundamentally important. And the it's binary economist says, no, no, no. The distribution of ownership is fundamentally important because capital is doing most of the work uh -huh. and its distribution uh -huh. affects its profitability. So that puts it in a paradigm. It's a paradigm. Uh, nature. That is, it's an interconnected things that relate all at once. You were talking about that paradigm thing and things changing. Another one is like in, in evolution. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, you know, you have a lot of quali quantitative change goes on. Then you have a thing called punctuated equilibrium. And the species appears. It happens all at once. It happens very quickly. Uh, a birth. You got a nine-month period of gestation, and then there's something been gestating. It's been quantitatively changing, and so forth. And then there's something new appearing. We appeared 200,000 years ago in the evolution of consciousness, and so forth. And so that kind of a change, uh, a, a paradigm, would be something that could try and set the right groundwork for. As James Joyce said, history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken. If that were the case for the human species, as we get to a point where we have the capability with weapon systems of destroying our whole species, and perhaps Michio Kaku says the whole process of life on this planet with our extended consciousness, there may be some sort of a Versailles and vision that we need in order to be able to survive. That's kind of a central question if that is, in fact, the case. We're celebrating. This year, 100, uh, the 100th anniversary of special theory of relativity that was an inflection point. But now we have the systems in place that could do it. And then on the positive side, we have a great unutilized capability that would be sufficient enough to be able to see that we are perhaps transcending the iron laws of scarcity 
and if that were the case seems to me economics has been the allocation of scarce resources to be done by these people economists and people who make those decisions but that's part of a paradigm that we may be waking up to a new challenge in terms of universe if we are or not going to make it as a species at this crucial moment the evolution of universal consciousness where does that fit in or how does it fit in or well I did it off the point I think well I don't know I think I I think that once we understand that capital is independently productive and that it's distribution it's the promise of its of the broader distribution of capital will ease scarcity will employ and utilize capacity growth growth yeah once we understand those yeah people will have a different participatory relationship to society they will be able to participate not only in the labor market and they will be able to participate not only in the welfare market but they'll be able to participate in the process of capital acquisition and it is difficult to get the the audience to to fully appreciate how one could implement the binary system because you need kind of a chart is yeah well we can talk through I try that some yeah with a board yeah we could we could do that we could do that but it is a voluntary process and the other moral dimension mm-hmm yeah is is that Smith was a moral philosopher yes he was yeah because capital can buy itself on the promise of its future income yeah and distribute the income necessary to purchase its output we can achieve this growth without redistribution and most of the strife that exists in the world has to do with the notion that it's a zero-sum game yes and my gain has to be your loss and if I'm gonna be enriched I have to take it from you you know everything you know the idea that there's no free lunch is an illusion because every time the sun rises the free lunches just stream down on earth we have growth potential that is non redistributionary and there's a big there's a huge difference between redistribution and an alternative and broader distribution that results from broader distribution of ownership that's right or by utilizing the unutilized the promise of broader ownership in time to think of a timeline yeah the broader so that we should have time ownership of ownership in time to promises more incentive to employ capacity in time one and more incentive to invest in time yeah so that the illusion of scarcity is a consequence of the concentration of ownership but the illusion of scarcity doesn't take from the rich yeah it doesn't have to now that's a huge thing if you have a thing where it's zero sum and you do not have to take from Peter to pay Paul it's been the case that has been the case throughout uh, all the in, that's in, yeah. in, in, in all the human experience so if there's such a transformation it's a big because we have institutions we have thought patterns yeah. everything has been predicated within a certain context uh, ontologically yeah. if we could for whatever a better term and that context has changed the Anjant regime in France of Louis the 16th had held for 700 years well, with a feudal pattern that was being subse- uh, subsumed by an industrial process that steam engine and whatnot and it was out of date with the zeitgeist or what was going on do you think the patterns that we've had for a couple hundred years now that are trying to operate this global system and so forth are being superseded <coughs> by the larger evolving reality <coughs> and that uh, there's some sort of a very new transformation well, and the binary economics might be the economic side of that uh, or right. the answer I to that large see that largely seen challenge that confronts us all <coughs> another one of the illusions that you're right one of the another one of the illusions that, that, that binary th- th- yeah. one of, well another one of the illusions that binary economics suspends and mm-hmm. again every it's just like when you see the certain and sun going around the earth is rather yeah. than the, or the earth going around in the sun rather than it changes the way you look at everything mm. binary economics changes the way you look at many many things yeah that yeah you take for granted it sometimes makes an up a down and uh. left and a right uh. but the illusion is mm-hmm. here and it's an illusion that confuses financial saving mm-hmm. for what we call real saving. Mm-hmm. And you will hear economists and, inv- and investment bankers and lawyers and others who should know better confuse real capital mm-hmm. with financial capital. Maybe you've heard you need sa- we need savings for yeah. capital formation. Yeah, right. And and one of the Lewis the subtitles of one of Lewis books is how to cut uh, how to how to cut cut us away from the slavery of past savings mm-hmm. and the point Harold Moulton wrote on that you know, Harold Moulton yeah. Harold Moulton the was the president of uh, Brookings in the, in the depression mm. came to the conclusion that if you look at the econometrics from let's say he went to about 1880 to, to 1930 something mm-hmm. when he wrote his formation of capital mm-hmm. he said 
although they say you need savings for capital formation, mm -hmm. the, the data is clear. During booms, our savings, uh, our investment, and our consumption mm -hmm. increased. Mm -hmm. And during busts, our our consumption, our investment decreased. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you do not need mm -hmm. savings in a physical sense, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a financial sense, for mm -hmm. capital formation. It is true that the same molecule mm -hmm. of iron cannot be both in a producer shovel and in a toy shovel. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you can't. In that sense, you need savings for capital formation. You need the physical molecule. Does but that the idea that you need financial savings uh, for capital uh, formation? Uh, uh, is quite another topic. I just wanted to ask you, does that molecule mo uh, metaphor you use work also for, say, like a uh, spear and a plowshare? It's exactly right. Okay, it's I just wondered, you know, in terms need, of the yeah, you know, don't need, It is Isaiah. true that you can't put the same molecule, uh -huh. but, but financial savings yeah. mm -hmm. is, is what's on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, when you teach your law students or, or accounting students or, or, or finance people, law of private property, assets, real savings, mm -hmm. are on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. There's a line, and then financial savings on the right hand. Financial savings are a claim mm -hmm. on real savings. Mm -hmm. They're a claim mm -hmm. on them. Uh, and, but so was the IOUs that the, gover that the, um, uh, that the company has, the, the debt and the, and the trade creditors, and the taxes that the government collects on, on companies. Yeah. So that's, that's financial savings is simply a claim on real savings. Mm -hmm. but but the broader potential, mm -hmm. the broader growth potential, the broader ownership itself can create a claim on future earnings. But the institutions in place now, you, I heard you say something before, and I'd be if you spell it out. You said that, uh, and let me just say, let me preface it by saying the logic of business finance is you're going to make an investment that pays for itself, pay for itself in a competitive period of time out of its future earnings. In a competitive period of time. No, that's a, that's the logic of yes. the, if it's a, if you don't if it's not it's a bad investment. Right. So the and investment bankers and people yes. have to decide and yes. do feasibility and, and it'll pay for itself even more broadly uh -huh. if it's acquired more broadly. Now that's it'll pay for itself even more quickly. That's the issue. That's an issue that's in defined. terms of what yes. you're saying yes. is that if the a, and the capital ownership is now that's another thing. Maybe we'll, they'll say well everything this is the best of all possible worlds because. We're all capitalists and so forth, but it's not the case. The capital ownership class very is a very small Basically group, and it's becoming. And the institutions that are in place are concentrating that ever more. Well, the capital <coughs> ownership it's, it's, through it's, time, the trend it's, it's in that, it's, it's and that's characteristic that not just of this economy, but each economy. There's a small class of a few people who own you it, set the templates for things in each of the countries and of the world economy itself, it's and true. that in itself is a, a problem, particularly. If, as Mr. Keynes said in his uh, letter to his grandchildren, he said, you're going to be confronted with technologically induced unemployment if you're trying to distribute all income to the people through employment opportunities because the technology is going to be massively displacing of that or well might be and could be. And so you've got a real conundrum. Of how are you going to distribute it? How are you going to distribute right income to the masses of the, the people? You've got right to. Okay, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. all part of the paradigm, it seems <coughs> to me. Am, yeah. I, am I off base no, or no, not? No, you're exactly right. All it's right. Just a, uh. It's just a part of, the, um, part of the approach. And the promise of broader ownership will simply promote a growth that would not exist mm -hmm. if the broader ownership were not there. It is the broader ownership yeah. that produces the growth. We, and, well. and my point mm -hmm. is, my fundamental uh, professional point, mm -hmm. is not that we should immediately uh, implement a binary economy. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't gone into the details, but, but that when we teach our students, mm -hmm. who then become the investment bankers of the future and the mm -hmm. lawyers of the future and mm -hmm. the social mm -hmm. engineers of the future and the, the politicians, and the and the politicians of, the of the future, future. Yeah. and the, uh, when we teach them mm -hmm. uh, the different theories of, of productive capacity yeah. and growth, that the yeah. binary theory mm -hmm. needs to be one of those theories that is included within the mix uh -huh. of things that are thought about. Mm -hmm. You know, there are also, we haven't talked about it, but there's also, uh, there's, there are political and, 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 and spiritual components of this, too. The political component uh, is very important in this respect. We think of democracy as being majority rule, uh, subject to protection of minority rights, bill of rights, and things like that. The binary notion of democracy is, is a bit different from that. Mm -hmm. According to the binary notion, Demo the essence of democracy is universal individual participation. Indivi universal, universal in, the, in individual. the affairs of society. In the universal affairs of society. In, in yeah. Universal individual. So one of the, the and the political power mm -hmm. is the right to vote. The 
the economic power, which is the other power that is of a civil it's the nature. The right to own a capital it's, it's base. The right to be productive. Uh huh. And the In right the way to be the productive, uh -huh. not only as a laborer, mm -hmm. but the right to be productive as a capital owner. Mm -hmm. and, and that's denied to the vast majority of the world population. Yeah. You know, on one, mm -hmm. but on, on one level, you can all now, the you assets can, owned to the yeah. are, are owned by the few. Yeah. Now you can take a look at historical view and say, mm -hmm. well, we can summarize binary economics. It's a strategy in a very mm -hmm. simple way. Mm -hmm. It combines three principles. That we that we embraced in the past and we have not carried forward into the future. Mm -hmm. First principle was the Homestead Act: mm -hmm. connect people with land, uh, because by the land will be productive, and their labor plus the land's labor mm -hmm. uh, uh, productiveness will make create citizens of a good nation. We and we had the, the dream of ownership. Yeah. Then we the second program is the FHA program. Yeah, it was great for home that ownership. Yeah. You know, people oh. could not acquire. Land, uh, uh, homes because they didn't have the down payment. Mm -hmm. So the substitute for that was the FHA. Well, we mm -hmm. need to take those two ideas and create an industrial homestead act, mm -hmm. where the capital that buys itself for the rich, with the help of credit insurance, will help buy itself for the poor it people as well. It, it, it we buys it that. for the rich with the help of capital insurance, did you say? And also, if I may, yes. uh, Lewis talked, if I'm not mistaken, not only insurance, maybe against casualty insurance, against uh, loss. Business loss. Uh, business loss. Yeah but also then a reassuring capability that the whole society yes. might engage in order to back up a reasonably expanded and appropriate insurance against loss, particularly business loss, particularly if the citizenry is going to be <coughs> vested in the in the stock market situation. It can't be a crapshoot where you no, can lose it. It has to be solid. And so you want to have <coughs> that, you'd have to have that solid, and you'd have to have these things added in a, in a general theory kind of way right. if you're going to institute that kind of a, of a policy. And that would be relevant to a lot of the hedge, a lot of the retirement people and so forth. They're getting very seriously concerned about the, the current situation and how financing is going to be done. So those are all problems that are right at front and center on the day's newspaper. The, the one of the things that the binary system would do was to get people to focus on a critical right, and that is the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Say it again. The right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Okay. Now, almost all capital today is acquired by the, with the earnings of capital. Retained according earnings. To doc, yeah. According to Dr. Wolf's uh, notion, 1% own 50% of the Edward wealth. Edward Wolf, that is. Dr. Edward Wolf, yeah. the 10% percent own 90%. Uh -huh. So right now, capital is acquired with the earnings of capital. What do, what do the rich use to acquire capital with the earnings of capital? They use non-recourse corporate credit. Mm -hmm. They use trust mechanisms. They use, they use lenders. They use insurance. And they use a friendly monetary policy. The same things that work for the rich uh -huh. can work for the poor as well. You simply open the system of corporate finance so that the poor and working people are able to, are able to participate what in the very process. And that what fuels the growth. That what is what produces the growth. What's lacking that has prevented that from being able to come up, walk upon the scene, as they used to say in the old jazz song, in terms of a, in a place I where there are people competitively looking at the opportunities and so forth. What has prevented that I from coming on the I scene? Think it's fundamentally just simply a, a, a lack of understanding about something critical, and that mm -hmm. is that capital is independently productive, mm -hmm. and it can buy itself for the poor even more profitably if they're cut into it than right now it's buying itself for the rich. It, it will uh -huh. continue to buy itself for the rich, uh -huh. but you can, more capital can buy itself if more people are included in the process. I understand, but what has prevented and, that and from and just that, evolving? That, understa that understanding. Yeah, but wha that's what. That's oh, what. Oh, that's oh, what. Oh, okay, and that's it. It's, it's a blind it. spot. We've been blinkered, or that's something a, like that. Or has now, there been a change that makes possible to us collectively now? Let's say on the living side. Rather, we looked at the darkness of the fact that the weapons can wipe out the whole species, mm -hmm. which is something that every concerned person is, conc is, con is, is concerned about. Now. Sure. But on the living side, has something changed that, that we have now a possibility that's opening as existentially significant as that destructive scenario that looms mm -hmm. and is growing that is equally si existentially significant in terms of altering the, well, the uh, for want of a better term, the ontology or something that makes now possible things that haven't been possible historically and ushers in a time where the binary paradigm really is exactly what is needed, whereas in an earlier time it would have been harder to institute. Or what, what has changed that makes this new kind of thing possible that hasn't been possible throughout the whole dark history of human history well, that's been ruled I by a few guys who ruled the roost? I think the increasing productiveness of capital uh -huh. is a process that has been going on mm -hmm. 
for thousands of years but it simply began to accelerate with the industrial revolution to an appreciable but so what's changed i think is in the is really what you call the industrial revolution which is still going on we have a post and that's your role well i still think about i mean you're talking about one i think it's all one yeah right i mean i you can say that now that the computer industry is post industrial but you know what it's industry makes computer chips i mean it's all well i mean no there's a connection but there is something about it in the nano thing and everything my view is that my view you one can take the difference that it's a fundamental change in quality yeah my view is that it's 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 a continuation it what people talk about this is an information psychology you know it's the economy and everything information knowledge workers my view is that when Homo habilis picked up a twig and yeah. began scraping, uh -huh. he was a knowledge worker, I see, or she I was a knowledge yeah. worker. Okay, okay. And yeah. so, and and you that, and then when when somebody gathering began putting things in sacks, because mm -hmm. a sack does work at home. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That yeah. does. If you can't, how much can you hold? Without and we're it? pretty unique as far as the creatures that make up, and it's all the Vedic. It's all a seamless web. It's all one system. We're here in this world. We don't. We lose. We're all. We're all walking around in a sea of bacteria. Everything's. Ba it's all one sure. seamless thing. But we divide everything up and so forth. Now, but we we come to and we do have this question of consciousness well, and we've had an evolution of kind we're just celebrating 50th anniversary of the death of Tahar de Chardin. we have this evolution of consciousness and the uh, uh, intellectual and the the body percept capability of taking the measure of the context with which we of which we are a part and it may be we're at a time of transcending what began 200,000 years ago we're going to come into a new relationship like this Gaia notion, a new relationship to the universe. We've got to get some sort of a positive something that's going to be positive against the loss other than, I would say, just uh, let's do the right thing. We've been saying that for well, 200,000 years, and we, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, well, to me, it's... Or maybe I shouldn't well, be bringing that well up. It's, it's, it's not I relevant, see, I, I guess, I to the binary see, thing. I don't see it as... I mean, I, I think a binary world will eventually, if it hasn't already, uh -huh. uh, lead to this idea that of transcendence Wh whether we have transcended scarcity in uh -huh. 1974 whether that happened in 1934 or whether it happens in 2020 it doesn't it doesn't matter the date the point is that there's a process going on yeah. by which capital is mm. doing more and more of the work okay right okay. and and yeah. the and the broadening of its ownership will uh -huh. do more and more of the distributive work necessary to make it even more even more productive. So you'd have so a system so that it's could it's favor both. You could have a system that would not have to look askance or in enemy terms to something that would be able to create leisure. Private for property instance, is what's know, essential for leisure. Private say. property is essential for leisure. Uh -huh. That's what gives leisure, uh -huh. private property. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and, and it, 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 it's, it's nice to talk about, you know, it's nice to talk about the people people's need for welfare it's nice to talk about people's need for well, jobs welfare but 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 what we really need mm -hmm. is the distribution of ownership because that's what provides real leisure mm -hmm. if you own the productive power of the horse or the uh, truck or i'd say a diversified portfolio in them in the productive companies of the mm -hmm. world that's th that is see one people one thing people say well this sounds like micro credit mm -hmm. enable somebody to get the credit Units, to, to yeah. acquire mm -hmm. Uh, let's say a sewing machine. Yeah. Well, the sewing machine still still requires you to do the sewing. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But how about being able to acquire a diversified portfolio in the garment industry? Uh -huh. Now that's a little bit closer. It's all six to billion the of us. Yeah, that's somehow that's going to be done. Because because there's a yeah. huge growth potential. Uh -huh. Someone comes yeah. to your office mm -hmm. and says, "I'm hungry." Mm -hmm. Give them a sandwich. That's mm -hmm. the wealth welfare function. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes to your office and says, "I need a job." Mm -hmm. Well, give them. Someone comes to your office and says, "I'm a I'm a garment worker, and I'd like to I'd like to help buy a sewing machine. Help uh -huh. buy it. But if somebody comes to your office and says, I need to be able to acquire capital at the earnings of capital, just the way the Rockefellers did. Is there any way of doing that? Uh -huh. The answer is there yes. There is no where. No, by, there's by no. It? Yes, oh, there is. Oh, oh, That's yeah. the understanding. Uh -huh. And and by the same token, you know the the the, the people who went who who work on the pension trusts. Uh -huh. You know uh -huh. they they, they uh, the, the fiduciaries. Uh -huh. I could go to my TAA Cref, which is my account uh, yeah. in, in, as, as a teacher. Say, uh -huh. you know, I've done pretty well. I'm born on the right side mm -hmm. of the baby boom. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there any way you can, TAA Cref can work to do just what it's doing now, helping yeah. me, uh -huh. but also help my children and grandchildren mm -hmm. acquire capital with the earnings of capital? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And those fiduciaries mm -hmm. need to know about that. Mm -hmm. They need to understand mm -hmm. binary economics. Yeah. The other one I was going to say is, is the religious and the, and the spiritual context here and this is the there's a great interest in this now in the Islamic world mm -hmm. because the binary system doesn't require the charging of interest yeah 
it, it, okay. It, 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 We've it, gotten it looks, around that. What we call yeah. interest yeah. is actually has different components. Mm -hmm. There's the bank service charge mm -hmm. for policing the loan, mm -hmm. finding the loan, doing this credit, the feasibility study, right. and doing the credit check, and doing mm -hmm. that and enforcing the loan. Mm -hmm. There's the insurance function, mm -hmm. which is the risk of <laughs> loss. Does that include all your the, the derivatives insurance. and things, or is that that's part? The, that's well, that's the risk. Those are yeah. risk factors. So you yeah. so you got to pay for the risk of loss. That's mm -hmm. the insurance. But the third element is simply renting money, mm -hmm. and that's the one. And that's the that's the the, the dead weight interest cost, which you can continue allow to allow people to do. People continue to can rent their money uh, if they want to. But binary economics provides the direct connection to the monetary model, uh -huh. which brings down the cost of capital and makes it all feasible. I can remember the uh, analogy that uh, Aristotle in Periclean Greece said uh, that you, ha you had the few who were of the demo, the, the, the few who the led, only. but the, uh, they, they were the few who led the life of the mind and the spirit and the things that were inherently interesting and understanding, but it was all based on a slave system. They've had slaves. We've had slaves throughout all of hu history to get the things done. And he said, he observed, I'm in the Pollock, I'm not sure where it was, but he said that uh, it would ever need be so until and unless the loom learned to weave. And the plectrum could so play itself. And the plectrum, so that gets a little bit tricky because that's getting into things of creativity Art. rather than just the mundane things right. of producing goods and services and moving information around the things that make up the economic right. concern. But we may be coming at a new kind of a relationship that's going to free people from having to be what they have been throughout human history. Uh, Marx has called them wage slaves, people that have no ownership of the real means by which things are being produced and the trend they're in or a stake in the trend that is so obviously part of it. And that's something why there might be so much political unrest in the world, at, a, at least at an economic and political level, that we really ought to be addressing if there are some solutions to that yes. large system seem, paradigm seem challenge to human society, it seems to me. Well, pe people are, ex are right now excluded from the, most people are excluded from the process whereby capital buys itself and then distributes itself. And that's the way most of the and capital is acquired. And, and they shouldn't yeah. be excluded from mm -hmm. that. But everybody needs to understand that. If people only demand jobs and welfare, that's yeah. all they're going to get, jobs and welfare. They need to understand that they can also negotiate participation in capital acquisition. Oh. With a broader understanding, this idea can work for everybody. Yeah. Now, there are those that say, but you know, some of the rich understand this, and they, they don't want the broad market. Yeah. Well, that's fine, well, but at least let's put, put that it on, on the, the table. table. Yeah. Some yeah. people yeah. say, I would rather own 100% of a pie that's this big mm -hmm. than 80% of a pie yeah. that's that big. Right. Well, yeah. if it's okay if that's your choice, yeah. but now put it on. Right yeah. now, as long as we're denying that the distribution of ownership has a positive relationship to growth, they mm -hmm. can say, we can't get any bigger yeah. unless, you, unless you give us tax benefits so we can mm. create more jobs and welfare. Oh, yeah. But there's another but way in which people can earn a living. But they're going to create the more jobs because that's the only way they have to distribute income. And now you're coming up against the Social Security baby boom thing that's coming, and the people are paying it. And, then you, and you do have this thing again. I don't know whether it matters, but they think they're just going to maintain these job functions for people from now until the end of time. But there's a, uh, there, there's a very real uh, warning in the trends of the world is that it's not the jobs that are creating the wealth. It is the technology, and the technology is what's important. And that has to be owned by the masses, not just the right yeah. to have a job to do what somebody who owns the capital yeah. tells them that they have yeah. to do. It's a kind of liberation yeah. blowing in the wind it for the whole of the world population. Liberation. And the technology is not some free-floating thing. The technology mm -hmm. is instant instantiated mm -hmm. in particular instantiate. machine. You see that term. Where'd you get that term? Where'd you get that term? It comes from uh, the first time I heard it was a mar fellow named Mark Reiner, a, a brilliant uh, binary That's economist. That's also coming from Ray Kurzweil, instantiate, but it has to do with yeah. nano yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay, instantiate. Yeah, that's a term that's going to become in the vocabulary. Yeah. But that's what a capital instrument is. It's uh -huh. an instantiate. When I say, again, a, a real capital instrument. Uh -huh. Financial capital instrument is a claim mm -hmm. on real capital. But mm. But the financial claims, mm -hmm. uh, if you say that broader ownership promotes growth, uh -huh. it's the broader ownership that's promoting growth, and that's what creates the claim yeah. on the new wealth, yeah. is because capital can buy itself even more productively when everybody's cut in. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the, and, and that's the, 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 the sun shines on the good and the bad alike. Yeah. It, sun, it shines on owners and, and non owners. And the existential challenge of weapons that can wipe us all out really does make it imperative, really, at a certain level, no matter how much they want to it's avoid it, to realize that we really are. And it sounds idealistic. You don't want to resort to idealism or like trying to do things by welfare, by quantities of need or being moral in those in the sense. But we are really all in this boat together. You know the and that that's like Gaia, that kind of thing, and that's a re that's a dawning reality that's going to perhaps make people up to some new things that they thought were not possible coming out of the oh super uh, we've subsumed the historical institutions within a newer pattern, and that that's what's about to emerge and going to have to be distributed. Knowledge of that should be uh, on the agenda of uh, all we concerned need, citizens. We need to teach Pathways these things to change, so people yeah. come to understand. It's, it's really a, the biggest barrier is a lack of understanding mm. that capital is independently productive uh -huh. and that it's a vast, important relationship to economic growth mm -hmm. and that there's really enough for everybody. Is, well, all right, now there it is. Has, in my view would be that hasn't been it is now, and we ought to we ought to bring that front and center. That that should be written on letters that high on every think tank in the world. There we have transcended scarcity. Yeah. That's my thing. Then that's happened since about 1970 in terms of that. But we've run out of time. We talked about these. We'll things make sure before. that we, we let, get people let to people buy this book. See the book. Let's buy Here this it book. is. Here it it's is. Explained and in and straightforward terms. Yeah. A anybody who, who, and who watches in a published program by like this, published by University Press of America. Okay, good. Anybody who can follow 60 Minutes can uh, follow this book. Okay, fine. Happy to have been able to share those perceptions with you, Bob. It's so good to see you. Welcome once again to New York. It's such and a pleasure. we'll distribute this out as best we can. To the, it may be that the word's going to go out first about the new way in which things are going to be done from the public access realm of cable of television, which is not so uh, ensconced within the older order of the. the it's a noble system. endeavor. Well, it's a thought. It's something worth thinking about. Thanks a lot. Thank so good you. to see you. It's always good to see Pleasure. you. Pleasure. And we wanted to let them know you've got oh, also. Oh, I compose classical music. He composes well, classical music as well. If you love well, Schubert, the then at least you're going to like Ashburn. That's right. If you love Schubert, you're going to love Ashburn. And you'll, you'll like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not okay. sure you'll love me. But yeah. you'll like me. If you'll, you'll like me. If you love okay. Schubert, you'll like me. So good to see you. Thanks for coming. Great pleasure. We in conversation invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow, so please do tune in. But we run the credits now. And thanks, Bob, for seeing It's always good to talk to you. And all the best with this it's book. Terrific. Here, let you do wonderful know. work here. Well, I don't know. We're, uh, it's public access is things to think about. well. Public access is really important, particularly as the media gets controlled by smaller groups and so forth, and they have a fixation on market fundamentalism that's very bothersome to me. This current administration is bothersome to me as I see it, and the trends of something new needed, and it'd be a place where something really new is can be done, in our universities or in our airwaves, but I think the message is going to come out first through this thing called public access, which is linked up with the non-commercial uses of the internet out there. I think there's a lot of hopeful things going on there, but that's a communications take on this. But it's always good to talk to you about this, because it's good to talk to somebody who's really talking something relevant. It's always yeah. a pleasure to be mm -hmm. around here and to interact with you, and your understanding of binary economics is very well, it seems to important. me as I look around, and that fellow from Indonesia, he came in, he said they presume all kinds of scholars, they looked at all the theorizing of Western economy, the only thing that makes sense to them, and they're really indebted, I mean really important, is binary economics, and it's not understood by practically anything.